Good afternoon and welcome to the Enlightenment Workshop. It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to the fourth and final session of this term. And for this last session, we're going to talk about a book actually published by the Voltaire Foundation and something very special is as an edition in three volumes that's part of the complete works of Voltaire, which is the core publishing project or has been the core publishing project for the last 40 or 50 years. We're now getting to the end of this huge project and at the end of 2021, we will have the whole of the complete works of Voltaire in print uh, in 203 volumes. And the two last big texts that we're doing are uh, an, interesting, well, an interesting contrast. On the one hand, there's a text that's very well known or apparently very well known, the Lettre Philosophique. And the other text, which I'm now going to hold up, except you have to imagine this is in three volumes, not just the one I'm holding up, is Voltaire's Précis du siècle de Louis XV, edited alongside his Histoire de la guerre de 1741, the history of the war of 1741. So this is perhaps one of Voltaire's least known historical works, Voltaire's history of his own century. Um, there have been partial editions in the past, but what's special about our critical edition is it's really the first ever complete attempt to present this text in a scholarly way. So it's a very, very special edition. It was edited by Janet Gordon and uh, James Hanron. And we have two discussants with us who are going to kick off the discussion. And they're going to talk a little bit about the book. And then of course, Janet and James will um, be asked to sort of comment on what they've said and take the discussion forward. Please, as we go through the um, evening, if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat box as soon as they occur to you. And I'm now going to hand over to Shifra, who's going to begin by discussing the book. And let me introduce Shifra. Uh, she'll be appearing on screen as I talk, I hope. Um, Shifra is Associate Professor in French and Francophone Studies at UCD Dublin, and also a member of the Humanities Institute. She's worked a lot on, in particular on 18th century French culture on Voltaire's historiography. I knew her when she was a research student in Oxford a long time ago, well, seems a long time ago, perhaps not. Um, and she's since worked also on 18th century female authors, the 18th century city, and she's written about the nature of doubt in 18th century French narratives. Um, she's written a very important book, Voltaire Historiographer, Narrative Paradigms, which was published by the Voltaire Foundation. And she's also the editor of a volume, The City in French Writing, The 18th Century Experience. And with James Hanrahan, she's also co-edited a book, The Dark Side of Diderot. Um, she's currently editing a book with the wonderful title, Turmoil in the Francophone 18th Century, um, and also completing a book, a, a, a Voltaire reference guide to Voltaire's life and works, which is forthcoming. That sounds like a major enterprise. You know, Shifra, it's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Shifra. Thank you, Nicholas. And thank you to Nicholas and Arby for the lovely invitation here today. So I wish to start today by congratulating Janet Garden and James Hanrahan on this edition of Voltaire's Histoire de la Guerre de 41, so from 1756, and his Précis du siècle de Louis XV, which is from 1768. And I really think the editor's extensive introduction to these three volumes must constitute the most detailed analysis ever to have been undertaken, either by contemporaries or by modern scholars, on these two relatively unknown Voltarian histories. So congratulations both of you. Now my own short response today will divide into three short segments. Firstly, a very brief overview of the two histories. Secondly, a focus on Voltarian historiography within the text. And finally, given that this is International Women's Day, I would like to finish with a glance at the space dedicated to women within the, this history. So firstly, the short overview, and then I will leave all matters pertaining to 18th century history to the next speaker, the expert Colin Jones. So the Histoire de la Guerre de 41 was begun by Voltaire while he was historiographe du roi, the royal historiographer appointed by Louis XV at Versailles. He held that post from 45, 1745 to 50. So an author, unauthorized edition of the Guerre appeared in 1755 and an authorized one in 1756. But then Voltaire just left this title to one side and he never pursued it further. So thanks to the editors today, the overlap between these two works of history is conveniently highlighted in grey shadowing within this lovely edition of the Guerre. And in their introduction, both editors speculate as to why the Guerre was put aside. And that's one question I'd like to invite them to maybe speak about this later today. <laughs> 
So subsequently, the Précis du Cirque de Louis XV was subsumed, or it, rather, it subsumed the Histoire de la Guerre de 41 material. So while the guerre starts with the War of the Austrian Succession from 1741 to 48, the Précis then traces the subsequent European shifting of alliances during the next global conflict, which is the Seven Years' War, so from 56 to 63. And particularly, the Précis traces France's own switch from supporting Prussia to supporting Austria. It's also helpful that the editors situate the Guerre and the Précis within the biographical context of Voltaire author. So the years of composition of these histories cover everything from 45 to 75, and Voltaire continued to write across all three grands, les, les trois grands genres littéraires, if you wish, at the time. So in terms of poetry, he composed the Poème de Fontenoy in 1745 and the Poème sur le désastre de Lisbonne in 56. They both mark, well, the Poème sur le désastre de Lisbonne Lisbon obviously marks the universal tragedy of, of that terrible earthquake, but both, both of those poems uh, present in events that, that actually are also present in the Précis. In terms of history, we have the Siècle de Louis XIV in 1751, Essay sur les Meurs in 56, the later Histoire de l'Empire de Russie sous Pierre le Grand, so between 59 and 63, and in terms of historiography, in these years, Voltaire writes the freestanding La Philosophie de l'Histoire in 65, and he also writes that same year his seminal article Histoire for the Encyclopédie. Now, as a playwright, of course, very, very briefly, we can't cover all his work here, but his tragedies include the controversial Mahomet from 42, Merop in 43, and then the very female focused tragedy Nanine, or the comedies Nanine and L'Ecossaise, the latter of which is obviously influenced by the Bonnie Prince Charlie episode. So all his life, Voltaire pursues this goal to be remembered by posterity as a great author, writing in the grand genre. And these two histories, I think, must be read as part of that very determined and very self-focused trajectory. I come now to focus on just five aspects of the Vilt Voltairian's uh, kind of the historiographical quirks, if you wish, within the writing of these histories, because in all of his, his historical works, Voltaire sustains a level of extra diegetic historiographical analysis, typically commenting on material from within his own texts as he writes. So firstly, the editors show how Voltaire swiftly edits mere errors of fact. And yet it's striking that the historian categorically refuses to pretend to omniscience. For example, he declares in the text, je n'assure point ce que j'ignore. I won't write about things I know nothing about. In these histories, as elsewhere, the historiographer comments on his own selections, his inclusions, his exclusions, and thus he presents history as a subjective tableau and possibly thus destabilizes the text as a factual narrative of history in so doing. The second instance of historiography I'm focusing on today is the introduction uh, where, well, what the introduction to this em edition emphasizes as the use of literary tropes that includes drama, pathos, suspense. There is a lovely example of this, for example, where Voltaire recounts the attempted assassination of Robert, by Robert Francois Damien of Louis XV. The text declares dramatically, and I quote, le roi fut assassiné, the king was assassinated. And this, despite the fact that all readers know that this was indeed a failed attempt at regicide. Another third instance of historiography uh, that's worth noting is where the em editors emphasize the anecdotal narrative tone. Voltaire historian seizes on human emotionality around any good historical story material. So we have the story of the Commodore George Anson and his 1740 voyage around the world. We have a depiction of him sowing seeds and bulbs in far-flung places. We have the story of Louis XV's monumental victory at the Battle of Fontenoy in 1745, or his illness after Metz. And then Voltaire also creates deep textual pathos where he tells the story of the young pretender, Bonnie Prince Charlie's unsuccessful 1745-46 Jacobite rebellion. The Précis also focuses on tragic victims, victims of circumstances of misjudgment or of bad laws. Voltaire exposes idiocy and judicial error on both sides of the channel in a rather mimetic twin tragedy of the Admiral Bing, who is of course the Admiral of Condide fame, tué pour encourager les autres, 
And then on the other side, the Franco-Irish general Lally, erroneously accused of treason by the French government after defeat at Pondicherry in India. A fourth instance of historic, historiographical quirks within the text is evident where the author uses the historical text for philosophical purposes. Now, in modern times, the signifier Voltaire has once again recently become a controversial and a complex one. And I think it's worth noting that both of these histories evoke slavery as a moral shame. When Genoa hands sovereignty of Corsica over to France, Voltaire philosophe frames this act within the historical narrative by asking how on earth selling or owning other humans can in any way be right. He says, il restait à savoir si les hommes ont le droit de vendre d'autres hommes, mais c'est une question qu'on n'examina jamais dans aucun traité. So Voltaire thus signals that the trading of humans should be addressed at the highest international levels and made illegal within the realm of international treaties. Finally, Voltaire sketches himself as a key player in contemporary historical events. And by extension, he becomes a key character within his own histories. And we literally, in this text, we spot the writer pop into the narrative as an extra diegetic voice, as if wishing to become entwined with the central diegesis of the historical narrative itself. Voltaire sketches himself as the international link between the Duc de Richelieu and the British Admiral Bing. Richelieu sends his written defense of the British enemy directly to Voltaire, the historian, and then the British Admiral Bing in turn sends him his self-defense directly also to Voltaire. And similarly, Voltaire would later underscore that he has personally worked very closely with the General Lally. He writes, l'écrivain de cette histoire travailla longtemps avec lui. And then he would later obviously write his 1773 Fragment sur l'Inde et sur le général de Lally in his defense. Elsewhere, Voltaire is keen to underscore his intense familiarity with court life. He recounts personally witnessing the scene of faction fighting at Versailles in 1725. He was also personally present at the court of Frederick the Great, so he underscores his first-hand experience there. And Voltaire can't resist emphasizing his unique and exclusive access to the psyche of the Prussian monarch. In one instance, for example, Voltaire narrates his own importance as a historian, telling a unique story, and he says it with delicious brevity. Cette anecdote est unique. This anecdote is entirely unique. In some senses, this self-important extra diegetic textual presence makes Voltaire read like a novelistic flashman character of the 18th century. That is, someone who witnesses all the major events, who knows, who influences all the major players in his time. However, the pop-up phenomenon does impact the work of history. It actually makes the work and its content even more immediate. So the narrative diegetic levels fuse um, with the ultimate result of perhaps making these histories more deliberately and unapologetically subjective ones. My final focus, given that this is International Women's Day, is focus on a reflection on the narrative and symbolic spaces dedicated to women within the Précis du siècle Louis XV. This is not something the editors have had space to dwell on particularly closely in the introduction, but nonetheless, I suggest that there is in fact a great rhetoric of equality and of admiration for women emanating from these histories. For a text that really hovers in the space of intercontinental wars, there are a surprising number of women sketched into the history, sometimes in supportive roles and sometimes in leadership roles. And I'll look at a few examples of both. So the historian loves to show how historical events depend entirely on the spontaneous and planned actions of supporting women. Many women stand out, and one of them is the Madame de la Marquise de Prix, who essentially single-handedly selects the next Queen of France, Marie Leginska. The text literally says, Elle la fille reine, she made her queen. So Voltaire may deplore the Marquise's lack of delicacy, but her, uh, his admiration for her energy, her female network, her dynamic and magnetic personality is clear from his flattering description of her as, and I quote, brillante, légère, d'un esprit vif et agréable. And another female figure who famously supports and in fact rescues a monarch, is of course the mythical Flora MacDonald, who rescues Prince Charles Edward Stuart after the disastrous Battle of Culloden. Our editors James Hanrahan and Janet Godden mischievously suggest that this perhaps enters the realm of creative writing rather than historical writing, but this is clearly how Voltaire captures the heart 
and the imagination of his readers. We don't necessarily remember the detail of battles, but we do remember the girl Mademoiselle MacDonnell and her poignant story. And Voltaire doesn't shy away from narrating strictly female realms such as pregnancy, childbirth, or the sadness of death in childbirth either. His cast of supportive women bring a soft, caring, recognizably feminine element, uh, and indeed female networking into the harder narratives of war. So my final observation today is about the second group of women in the text, who are the actual great women leaders, queens, tsarinas, empresses. Voltaire actually equates these type of women to men. Yes, men. He flatters and exalts them in that way. And as early as 1728 in La Oignade, Voltaire had written lines whereby Henri IV says to the Elizabeth I of England that she, the queen, ranks amongst the best of the greatest men. L'Europe vous compte au rang des plus grands hommes. So um, he distinguishes between heroes and truly great leaders. Vous savez que chez moi, les grands hommes vont les premiers, les héros les derniers. J'appelle grands hommes tous ceux qui ont excellé dans l'utile ou dans l'agréable. Les saccageurs de province ne sont que des héros. So again, the 18th century lacks a female rhetorical term to describe the great woman leader, but it is clear that Voltaire's text admires the women who rule their country or indeed lead an empire. Twice he evokes the fact that contemporary Russia has recently been governed by no less than five women in succession. He lists them and then he repeats the amazing phenomenon. Cynics might say he wished to flatter Catherine the Great, but in fact, this message is much more focused on the absolute equal ability of women to lead their country and their people and to lead well. So now we come to my final textual focus of today, who's the example of Maria Theresa, Queen of Hungary, Empress of the Austrian Empire. Maria Theresa is not just a great polit politician and leader, but Voltaire notes that she invites other distinguished women to eat at her table. She's incre incredibly courageous against the odds. She gives a speech at Presburg with her eldest son in her arms. <laughs> it's ironic but remarkable that after that speech, the Palatine soldiers will shout, Mourons pour notre roi, Marie-Thérèse. Voltaire comments that we must fall back on the terms notre roi or le grand homme metaphor perhaps in order to describe the queen who is in fact equal to a king amongst her people. Now, Maria Theresa dominates Europe from 40, 1740 to 1780, but I'd like to suggest today she also dominates much within this contemporary work of history. Voltaire exudes deep respect and admiration for the Empress, whom he does consider one of the key players on the European chessboard, even though he did not personally speak with her or visit her court. So on International Women's Day, I leave you with the celebration of Maria Theresa as a grand homme et un roi, and I wish to once again congratulate the editors on their magnificent resurrection of this contemporary work of Voltairean history. Thank you. Shifra, thank you very much indeed. That was a, a brilliant overview of all sorts of problems posed by the text. And um, it was very nice too that you brought in the women characters at the end, even if they're really men. And um, there are lots of, you raised lots of really interesting questions there, which we'll come back to. I think what we should do now is move over to Colin, if that's all right, and hear what hear Colin's thoughts, and then we'll bring together the questions you've raised and other questions for the debate afterwards. So thanks again. I'm now, it's my huge pleasure to introduce Colin. Um, Colin Jones used to be a member of the Voltaire Foundation board, so he knows the Voltaire Foundation very well. Um, as you know, he's professor of history at Queen Mary University of London and currently visiting professor at the University of Chicago. He's one of the leading historians of 18th century France and the French Enlightenment and the French Revolution. And he's worked particularly on the history of medicine and the history of Paris. His recent books include The Smile Revolution, uh, 2015, and A History of Versailles, 2018. He's recently been working on one day of the revolution, but a rather special day. And his book, The Fall of Robespierre, 24 Hours in Revolutionary Paris, is coming out with OUP, I think, in the summer of this year. That's, I think that's right, Colin. Um, he's currently working, because we've been talking a bit about it, on an amazing co secret correspondence of the revolution by the Dowager Duchess of Elbeuf. Um, and I think maybe Arvi and I might be asking you to come and talk to the workshop perhaps about Elbeuf, maybe next year. I think it's, it's a, I know it's a fabulous subject. But for today, thank Colin, thank you very much for joining us. I think you're joining us from Chicago. And uh, so thank you for being in the right time zone with us. And thanks for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you. It's very nice to be here. I really enjoyed that first session, which I think gave a wonderful 
flavor of the uh, this incredible text which we have um, before us um, uh, today to, to consider and also the, the flavor and the, and the sort of color which is in the text. So I'm coming in as a historian rather than a literary historian. Um, but I mean, I would just like to say, uh, Shifri used the word magnificent for this edition. I do actually agree. I think it's an absolutely astonishing piece of work on uh, uh, Janet and James's uh, uh, part because it's it's not just doing an edition of a, a text. It's a text which is so complicated and so multi-layered, uh, and so the and in which the author has gone on for an endless sort of editing, filleting, um, uh, establishing overlaps, rewritings, thinking about concordances. I mean, it's just so complicated. It must be, have been, editorially speaking, like a, sort of trying to untangle a whole pile of sort of interlocked knots and then sort of just get it in the, and it, at the end of the day, you think, well, the, the leisure demand, the sort of manual skill required is pretty amazing, but then they actually lay it out and it's, well, I wonder, push the metaphor too much, but you get this wonderful piece of embroidery, which is the text. And I think it's a wonderful uh, piece of uh, editorial uh, skill. Um, the, the level of the competencies, which are the two editors bring is pretty amazing. I think that one of them must be patience actually, to actually have done this text. It, it, that's such a complicated set of texts and just worked it, worked it out in the way that they do and lay it out in a way which we as the reader really get a sense, and as, as you say, it's something I want to come back to, um, we know where we are in the text or the texts, if, if, if you like. So I'm coming to this, as I say, as a historian, although not one that particularly knew these uh, texts before, um, uh, before this exercise, but I'm obviously not a historian of, of Voltaire, but I am a historian of the 18th century. And interestingly, you know, I have written a book on the, um, uh, the 18th century from 1715 to uh, 1799, two thirds of which was obviously the century of Louis the uh, uh, 15th. And my, um, uh, my book, The Great Nation, published by Penguin in 2002. And when I did that book, and I'm not actually now comparing myself to Voltaire, you'll be pleased to, to know, but when I, I did it, I was um, sort of inspired really by the inspiration or at least the title of the, uh, of the Voltaire, because one of the things which was very striking about the histories of the eight, of 18th century France as, the, as were then available, I think, was that the reign of Louis XV really got sort of wiped out uh, as a political uh, sort of framework because so much of the history of the 18th century jumps from you know Louis XV's death in 1750 and then suddenly we're into the uh, the causes of the French Revolution and most historians when you look at the books which were available uh, uh, up till then I think it's probably true of a lot of them now do a sort of structural type of approach to uh, to, to account for what what goes on for the rest of the 18th century and tend to really start things going only about 1770 maybe uh, 1750 or, or whatever so I thought when doing this book I thought well that's one of the things I will try and do is to, to is to cent to center it on the on the figure who actually dominates the, uh, chronologically at least and politically uh, the, the the century Louis the 15th uh, from 1715 to um, uh, 17, uh, uh, 1770s. I must say that, you know, what apps are starting at the beginning was fascinating for me, and I totally loved the Regency in a way that clearly uh, Voltaire didn't, but uh, that apart, you know, I think uh, it is very interesting to have gone back and, uh, and now be looking at this um, book, which uh, covers the reign in a different way. But it is a narrative, and that's, I think that's really important. And yet he has to consider Voltaire he, he has arguments to make and you know you, narrative isn't as just one damn thing after another when you're writing you actually have to try and fashion your argument through the narrative through the sort of uh, the chronological flow and that calls for all sorts of rhetorical devices and uh, approaches many of which Shifri uh, uh, was talking about uh, 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 originally. If I look back now at that moment in 2002 so I guess I was working it for, for a couple of years beforehand uh, and say, well, if I was writing it now, what would it be different? Of course, it would be different in many, many respects. The biggest thing actually I got wrong, which Voltaire got right, or as I say, I'm not making a comparison between the books, uh, is that basically he, he does see the rain in global terms. I mean, I think um, very interesting, particularly on his study of the Seven Years' War, rather less so with the uh, War of Austrian Succession. It is a global war, you know, and this, this I think, is very much the way in which uh, historiography of the 18th century, 
historiography generally actually has gone since uh, 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 2000, 2000, uh, 2002. So I think going back on that and thinking of that as something which uh, links up with contemporary concerns, the global uh, framework and the global context uh, of that war and now historians quite quite regularly and routinely describe the Seven Years' War as really the first step in the, the, the age of revolutions. And of course, the book actually does use the term revolutions for the things that are going on in the 1750s. But when I wrote my book uh, uh, on the history of the 18th century, I don't, you know, it's, it's a point in time, you know, it comes out uh, and it discusses the 18th uh, century, two centuries before. But, you know, just compare that really and contrast it really uh, with Voltaire, because Voltaire is writing it, um, uh, you know, first of all, without the sort of historiographical mountain, which I had to sort of try and climb up to, to write in the, in the year 2000. So much over two centuries had been published uh, on, on, the cent uh, on the period, actually. And, uh, and, you know, even more in the last couple of decades of the uh, 20th century. What I think, and I'd like to know more perhaps for the editors, were the other histories of the period that uh, uh, Voltaire could be considering, could be subsuming, if you like, could be trying to bounce off or build on or, or, or whatever. But clearly, you know, unlike my, my st uh, studies two centuries later, it is the sort of history uh, of the present. It's, a, it's an immediate history, histoire immediate, you know, where he's actually sort of living, uh, living in the period that he's describing. And as she said, you know, he is a participant as well. Oh, you, I was there, we occasionally get, you know, I know that because I talked to someone who was there, that sort of sense of participating in the events um, in which, which he's, he's talking about, which is so different, I think, than uh, the sort of history which we can do now of, of, the, of the century. But the other thing I think, which is incredibly, uh, well, it makes for the complication in, in some ways, is that he is speaking not from a fixed point. You know, okay, my fixed point was a couple of years, I guess, when I'm doing the research. He's actually, this is something which is, as she said, he starts writing in 1745, starting in sort of 1744, 41, uh, and then he's still publishing the, uh, you know, the book comes out, uh, the Crecy in 1768, and there's a bit of addition uh, as well. So, you know, this is a, a book which is, it's not just this, the period which he's covering, which is moving, which is moving chronologically along, but he himself is moving along over this uh, period. So the sense of knowing where one is with these texts, I think is rather extraordinary. It's rather like a sort of parallax effect, really, where it's not just the, the object that you're seeing which is moving, it's actually the observation point as well is moving. That makes for such a complex, such a, a difficult sort of spatial, sort of mental uh, sort of uh, set of problems that I think that's why we're particularly grateful uh, to the editors, because I think they give us of this text a sense that where, wherever we are in the texts, we know where we are. We have a, a friend, a guide, uh, two friends, two guides, uh, to, to tell us where we are and, and sort of uh, uh, um, uh, explain where we are. And I think also, you know, just to talk not just in terms of uh, his observation point and what he's describing, but also I think his identities are changing uh, as a historian, what he means by his history, in fact, is changing over this, uh, uh, this period. So as, um, as you probably know, as we said, you know, he starts off 1740s, he is a royal historiographer, historiographer. No one quite knows what that is, but you know, one of the things it clearly is close to is chief propagandist or chief um, flatterer. Uh, of the monarch and you know initially he thinks of it as this is going to be a book about Louis XV's campaigns you know sort of Alexander the Great Julius Caesar something we've got Louis XV very centered on the uh, monarch very much you know going to be telling things not just through his eyes but but you know through through a sort of admiration model which will probably emphasize his glory you know, the, the gloire of, mon of, uh, of battles and histories and, and uh, uh, victories and, and all the rest of it and we get you know in particularly in the war of 82 it is a sort of you know history of battles you know history you know the fact he after each of the battles he does these uh, the big battles he talks about the casualties you know so we're talking about honor here we're talking about glory you know these sort of very very traditional uh, sorts of things 
Then, of course, you know, by the end he's, of the period when he's writing the, uh, when he's publishing the 1768 edition, he's a different sort of guy altogether. He's lived through the 18, 1750s. He's lived through Candide, you know, which is one way of thinking about war and the uh, peace. And he's also passed through, as uh, you as said, the Essay sur les Meurs, 1756, which offers, you know, not this sort of close chronology, you know, this close factual thing with the participants all sort of moving around and describing descriptions and pen portraits and that sort of thing. He's talking about the, you know, the, the sort of progress of the human, human uh, mind. So he's moved away from this sort of participant, Israel media sort of uh, thing, up into the realms of the sort of philosopher historian, the sort of Olympian uh, heights that he's uh, uh, occupied. So I think this is, you know, it makes, a, you know, as the editors say, it makes it a, the texts uh, or texts uh, 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 sort of hybrid uh, uh, or patchwork uh, sort of uh, uh, thing that we're, we're, we're looking at. Um, I guess, you know, just to finish really, you know, just to look again at the point I made, you know, how do you, how do you explain things, uh, the past, rather than just narrate it, or how do you explain through uh, uh, narrating it? And, you know, he's going to have different answers to that over the, over the period in which he's actually writing, as his observation point is, is moving. You know, obviously, to start with, it's old style sort of uh, chronicle, you know, one damn thing, one damn victory after the other, if you like. But, you know, you soon realize that it's a much more artful exercise as well. And I think, you know, what I, I think um, the editors bring up, but also Schiffer's talk as well, the importance of a colorful, particularly colorful, get people involved, interested, amused, anecdote. The anecdote, I think, the sort of little story you know, that just sort of pulls you in, but also offers a sort of explanation which you perhaps hadn't thought or thought possible. Um, he's very much seeming to, you know, even though he's floating above and uh, by the end in these sort of the realms of uh, the meanings of the past, um, he, he's very much um, sort of trying to resist a religious model of uh, a providential model uh, of, of human, human affairs. Uh, and he, he pricks the, he puts the pin in the, uh, he punctures that sort of uh, uh, version by this emphasis on anecdote. You know, I think it was Pascal who said, wasn't it, that uh, Cleo, if Cleopatra's uh, nose has been shorter than the, you know, the history of the world would have been uh, 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 different. Uh, and this idea of the counterfactual, you know, I think is very much Voltaire, you know, so Charles VI dies uh, at the wrong moment because he's eaten too many mushrooms or something like that. So I think that sort of um, Cleopatra's nose sort of thing. You can even say uh, in Voltairean spirit that uh, if Cleopatra's nose hadn't existed uh, in the 18th century, Voltaire would have had to uh, invent it. So that sort of sense of um, counterfactuality, I think, um, uh, and sort of uh, anecdote and, uh, uh, and uh, just the, the unusual fact sort of puncturing this thing, gives this, uh, this whole, um, this whole um, uh, text a sort of interest, draws you in uh, and makes you admire basically uh, a piece of narration which it also has so much explanation uh, and so much philosophy uh, to offer. Thank you. Colin, thank you very much indeed. That was a fantastic uh, view of the text. It's interesting, but you, you, uh, but you came with the text, obviously differently from Schieffer, but you both thought that it was incredibly vibrant and evasion, which is true, isn't it? It is an amazingly, um, uh, well, it is an extraordinarily sort of vibrant piece of writing, actually, in the, in the use of anecdote, which is, it, 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 it is very remarkable. Um, I think, yes, I'm very taken too with this idea that Voltaire is um, not just writing contemporary history, which is different, of course, from writing history of the past, but, the, but the, he writes it over such a long period so that it is jumping from one moving vehicle to another, so that he's, the history is changing and so is he. So you have a very complex text in multiple dimensions. I think that's a really interesting, I think that's a, that exp, as you said that, that, it makes the various thoughts I've had about the text suddenly come into focus. It explains why certain things are hard to pin down. So, well, well these are fantastic questions which we'll come back to. Um, and first of all, can I say, I'm, I'm now going to introduce Janet, but before I do that, can I just say to everyone listening, please do send in your questions. If you, don't wait in case you forget them. So as you think of questions, please put them in the chat box. And then when we get to the um, end of the responses, I'll be ready to field your questions on your behalf. But it's now my pleasure to introduce Janet, who with any luck will appear on the screen as I say that. Um, Janet Gordon is, tra is trained as a historian and has worked for a very long time at the Voltaire Foundation. 
and for the last two decades has been my deputy running the Complete Works of Voltaire. So um, without Janet, we wouldn't have completed the Complete Works of Voltaire. It's a huge pleasure to have Janet here today. Um, we've, uh, when we sort of um, decided how to manage the project and steer it to conclusion, um, I uh, confided in Janet the preparation of all the historical works in the edition. So Janet has, knows more than anyone else about the historical works of Voltaire in the Complete Works. Um, she was a major figure running the edition of the Essay Sur les Meurs. She's edited lots of the individual texts herself. So her collaboration with James on this edition is just the last of a long series of, of her works on Voltaire's history. Janet, it's a huge pleasure to see you. Um, and I'm inviting you to perhaps respond to what Schieffer and Colin have said or present your thoughts about the edition. Over to you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, and we're grateful to you and Arvi for including the, uh, our edition in this year's workshop programme. Uh, and thank you very much, Shifa and Colin, for your kind words and the interesting uh, points you make that we'll try to uh, address as we go along. These volumes probably haven't reached the shelves uh, of university libraries yet. And if they have, readers have probably not been allowed in to read them, which would have been a novel situation for Voltaire, whose books were more generally banned than his readers. So I will first outline the very complex genesis uh, and programme of our two intertwined texts uh, that uh, Corinne and Schifra have alluded to, uh, and then say a few words about the little known Guerre de Quarantéen. And James will then be talking about the Précis as a whole and its place in Voltaire's history of modernity. The Précis developed over several years weaving together two large strands as different as chalk and cheese. And the first strand is the Guerre de Quarantéen. And this writing of the Guerre uh, was sparked by Voltaire's appointment uh, as historiographe du de France in April 1745. And it wasn't his first choice of honour. And when first offered it, he could see a long way down his nose at it. But then in May, France's uh, victory at the Battle of Fontenoy and the success of his own poem on the subject provided him with a ready-made opportunity to practice uh, this new métier. This much was sheer serendipity. A major attraction of the appointment in the first place had been the status it would give Voltaire uh, as a serious writer of history. But at that point in 1745, the epic essay sur les mœurs, source of the eventual second strand of the Précis, was no more than a plan with versions of some early chapters published in the Mercure and its sequel, the Siècle de Louis XIV, had been dormant since 1739. The immediacy of the guerre, therefore, promoted it to the front burner of Voltaire's historical writing and the Campagne du Roi, covering the King's victorious Flanders campaigns of 1744 and 1745, was completed by early 1746. Much of the second half, covering the rest of the war, was probably drafted in late 48 to 1749. All three texts, Active Guerre, Dormant Siècle and Embryo Essay, were affected by the disruption to Voltaire's life and work caused by his move to Berlin in 1750, and all three came to fruition, if only partially, in Berlin in 1751 to 52. But when in the spring, of 1752, Voltaire sent manuscripts of the Guerre to influential advisers in Paris, hoping to um, uh, put out feelers for the publication of at least the Campagne du Roi. Cold water was thrown uh, on the idea. And in 1755, a flurry of protests from Voltaire surrounded uh, the uh, unauthorized publication in Paris of a purloined manuscript albeit one possibly purloined uh, with his own tacit connivance. But by then, another war was looming and France's former enemy, Austria, became her new ally. The moment had passed for an account of the previous war uh, and the guerre was put aside. And this, I think, is uh, a partial answer to uh, Schiffer's first question about why did Voltaire give up in 1755? I think it's also partly uh, because the reception of the uh, manuscripts he sent to Paris in 1752 were discouraging. Uh, 
and too many people that Voltaire would have liked to impress uh, felt that he had too, done too much to praise his own friends, notably Richelieu, uh, and um, reduce the important part uh, played by people on whom he was not on such good terms, such as the Maréchal de Saxe. So returning uh, to the essay sur les mœurs, originally entitled Essay sur l'histoire générale, this mammoth history was first mentioned by Voltaire in 1742 with the subtitle Depuis Charlemagne jusqu'à nos jours. Enlarging on the project three years later, Voltaire declared that the Siècle de Louis XIV would not only be part of the essay, uh, but the culmination representing the pinnacle of civilization. And this approach is clear in the Cramer edition of Voltaire's complete works in 1756, which was the first uh, appearance of the essay. And here, five years after its publication as a separate work, the siècle appears under the overall title of Essay sur l'histoire générale, following the essay in a single sequence of chapters with some additional chapters covering the years since 1715 mostly taken from the by now redundant Gare. Further chapters were added in 1763, and it was not until 1768 that the three works were separated. The essay was given a new conclusion and its own introduction, La Philosophie de l'Histoire, and its subtitle was changed to the, a rather weak, I would say, Depuis Charlemagne jusqu'à Louis XIII. The siècle uh, floated free and the remainder of the guerre was merged with the existing post-1715 chapters to create the Précis du siècle de Louis XV. A few further chapters were added uh, after the death of Louis XV in 1774, and this was the state of the Édition Encadrée of 1775 and remained the definitive text. Enter the current edition of the complete works uh, of Voltaire. Though even here, the original planning of the Oxford edition in the 1960s omitted the Gare as a separate text. Since then, easier access to libraries behind the formal Iron Curtain and the arrival of computer searching and scanning technology has meant that the complete works can now really mean complete and the Gare is published for the first time in Voltaire's complete works alongside the Précy, which indeed owes it so much. More easily done said than done, though. We found it hard to know which loose ends to pull on first. In agreement with Nicholas, we tackled the Précy first, as Voltaire's final word on these texts, and as having a stable editorial history. Here we were faced with two texts, one inside the other, almost like a pair of Russian dolls, except that the inner doll, uh, the Gare, was the larger of the two, 28 of the 43 chapters that comprise the Précis come from the Gare. Unpicking Voltaire's cut and paste to identify the numerous bitty passages of overlap between Gare and Précis was a formidable task. We're indebted to our colleague Alison Oliver here, who set up and supervised this work through to showing the shaded passages on the final printed page. Then in the Gare, we are faced with three manuscripts of 1751 to 1752. Two luckily for us turned out to be almost identical, but the third in Voltaire's library in St. Petersburg shows clear signs of being copied from an earlier version and contains the first half only, closely resembling the unauthorized printing of 1775. In addition, the Bibliothèque Voltaire in St. Petersburg also contains numerous preparatory notes and drafts. Thank you, Jack Iverson, for sending several of them our way. Although the Guerre recounts a single war, it is striking that in its final state in 1752, <coughs> excuse me, the two distinct parts of its composition still remain very visible. The first part, the Campagne du Roi, was written to please the king and to show him at its best, which it, which it did. But after 1746, Louis joined his army less frequently and the second part has Frederick behind it, hidden in plain sight, with the 1746 text 
of his own Histoire de Menton open on the table. <clears throat> Partly, no doubt, because of the ambivalence in France towards Frederick, but also because the last two years of the war and the peace treaty that ended it were less glorious than Voltaire and the French public had hoped. The second half of the guerre seems flatter than the first. Perhaps an awareness of this, but in any case, intending to relieve perceived monotony of siege and battlefield, the second part includes several self-contained chapters. Three of more direct human interest, a long chapter on Anson's voyage round the world, and a couple of even longer ones on Charles Edward Stuart and the Jacobite uh, rebellion and here comes Flora MacDonald as one of the only women uh, in the text, I'm afraid, apart from indeed Maria Theresa. Two others at the end of the text, two other chapters, epitomize the colonial struggle in Canada and India in the 1740s. Despite the broad appeal of Bonnie Prince Charlie and the perhaps disproportionate space he occupies, the Gare was not written primarily for the literary educated public that had praised the poem de Fontenoy and for whom Voltaire's other histories had been designed. First and foremost here, Voltaire has in mind a predominantly court and army readership. This was not a small audience, and it does not turn the guerre into military history, but the subject was of time-limited appeal. And finally, the text is written in the voice of the historiographer. It is written as a record for posterity, it is based primarily on eyewitness and oral accounts of which Voltaire was proud. Indeed, he boasted that he knew more about the subject than anybody else. In the avant propos, he summarizes the task he set himself and explains the tightrope he walked. Il est utile de savoir la vérité de ce qui nous regarde, he writes, difficile de la démêler et dangereux de la dire. So he relegates what happened clearly, he relates what happened clearly, comprehensively, and with little personal comment. There's little military detail. It is as accurate as it can be, and it is impartial. Something else Voltaire was insistent about. You recognize his sureness and lightness of touch, but rarely hear his point of view. The narrative is enlightened by anecdotes, but almost anything expressing an opinion it's attributed to someone on the scene in indirect or sometimes direct speech. It is a straightforward chronological account with none of the enigmas that characterize the Précis text. But despite this picture of perhaps rather solid worthiness, the Guerre is a fascinating text. It's certainly a part of the history of Voltaire's time, although it does not contribute to his history of the esprit humain and it stands apart from modernity. Melding this into the surrounding Précy with its quite different historical purpose needed the skill of a Voltaire, which luckily it found, of course, and this is what James is going to talk about. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Janet. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting, um, you almost made it sound simple. And I remember all those long meetings we had as we wrestled with how we could um, explain the complexities of this text. I think it's probably right to say, isn't it, this is the single most complicated text or texts in the entire Voltaire and oeuvre, I think, in terms of the genesis. I don't think we ever had to grapple with anything as hard as this. I think it's, it is extraordinary. And now, but uh, you've raised several really interesting questions as well as answering some of the questions, but before we go on to that, I'm, I think we would like to hear from James. So James will be joining us in the, is joining us now. Um, James Hanrahan is Associate Professor of French at Trinity College, Dublin, um, and is a real specialist in literature, but also the history of 18th century France. Um, his thesis dealt with the Parlement uh, of France and was published as a really important book by the Voltaire Foundation in 2009, his book Voltaire and the Par Parliaments of France. And he's also co-edited with Chiffre a book called The Dark Side of Diderot, which is a great title. Um, and James has, all, before this edition, has made a huge contribution to the complete works of Voltaire, um, editing a very large number of texts, 
Um, the thing about Voltaire's historical texts is they go from the very big to the very small. And he wrote things about the Pays de Gex in the little part of France where he lived. And James is probably the world authority on the text of the Pays de Gex, which could be another whole seminar. Um, but now I'm handing over to James to sort of um, perhaps continue where Janet left off and respond to the questions, please. And also think about your experience of the, te of the text. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Nicholas, and thanks to you and, uh, and Abby for for inviting us to this um, session, and also to uh, Schiffer and Colin for their very generous comments and for the time they've taken to um, read the the text. It's it's th three volumes of text. I think when we when we started out this um, process, we never expected that we would be publishing this um, as, as three volumes. I certainly didn't think that um, um, when we were sitting around uh, those pints of Guinness in Dublin in 2012, Nicholas, um, and when you produced at the right moment, the contract for <laughs> the critical edition of the of the Précis. But um, yeah, that's where we are. It's been um, a, a long process. And I suppose it's, uh, it, it's, it's good to, to, to understand how, or to, to see how um, Shia Fred and Colin, who are, you know, some of our first um, uh, readers outside the, the Voltaire Foundation have recognized the, 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 the complexity of what was involved in um, this process. It was really a, a, a complex editorial process. And it was one that um, I, I suppose I continue to, but Janet and I continue to ha have questions about ourselves um, as we went through it, because in a way, I think our edition um, of the two texts together, a double edition, is um, it, it doesn't really follow the, the, the standard way to do uh, critical edition within the uh, OCV, within the complete works of um, Voltaire, because um, just because of the, the, the complexity and the, the, the relationship between the two texts. I mean, just to put it in, um, uh, in terms of uh, figures, what you have with the, uh, with the guerre, um, th that text represents 54% of the précis. Okay, so when you're reading the Précis, 54% of that text in terms of, you know, word count, let's say, or line count, really, um, is taken from uh, the Histoire de la Guerre de 1741. Um, and then at the same time, that uh, Histoire de la Guerre is, has to be reduced by 42% itself in order to be inserted into the Précis. So you have this very close relationship between the two texts. I think the other thing that's important to um, to think about, and one of those questions that just constantly came back to me um, when we were going through um, this process, is, you know, how do you deal with the Histoire de la Guerre de 1741? It's important to remember, first of all, that no edition of this text in its complete form was ever overseen by Voltaire in his lifetime. And in fact, the first edition of it that was actually published was in the 1970s. Uh, Jacques Morin, uh, who did it in the uh, Gallimard series. So we had a text which was, um, I suppose, you know, hidden from view for um, so long, but yet at the same time, it wasn't a text that was uh, hidden from, from view or forgotten about because uh, Voltaire himself didn't think it was important. In a way, you can see in his correspondence, you can see in the way he's prepared the, the text and even in the way Janet d d d describes it ju just there, that he spent a huge amount of time and energy um, on this text and dedicated a lot to creating this coherent narrative, which was, as Janet has said, quite different from um, what he had done in his other historical works. So. First of all, there's, there's that, I mean, how do you deal with that, let's say, as an editor in the 21st century? And particularly when about half of that text is actually comes into or forms part of um, another text, which everybody remembers and everybody recognizes, even if it doesn't receive a huge amount of attention, um, but which was overseen by uh, Voltaire in his lifetime and which 
um, you know, was published under the, the title that we see it published under today. How do you deal with those two things? So what we had to do really was uh, the, the, the image that I would use um, in, in talking about it would be that we had to almost take a cross section of the Précis in order to understand it. And I think that our approach was really dictated by our desire to see an opening up of these two texts. First of all, I mean, the, the, the Guerre, because it had been so, um, had not really been known and ha had not really been published and had never received the critical edition treatment uh, before. And then the Précis, because it had sort of been seen as something that um, was of, of, of lesser importance to the siècle and also slightly derivative in the sense that uh, half of it had actually come from another text. Uh, so what we had to do really was um, set about uh, presenting this cross-section of the text and see how does it understand? I mean, we could have taken the Précis and we could have looked at the Précis and just an analysed that text as we see it today. But in a way, um, in order to really understand the text, we had to see it as this uh, patchwork, which um, is the term we use and which, which um, Colin uh, mentioned there. That we, we had to see it as a patchwork in order to understand it, in order to understand how it had developed over this period from 1745 all the way up to 1778 in fact when the, the final uh, changes um, uh, were made to it so um, for that reason you know we begin with the the guerre and analysis of the kind of the, the, the background and how that uh, came about and then when we move on to talk about the précis in a way we've already described a lot of it by describing the guerre. So you can't reproduce that. So instead, what we do is we start to, uh, what we really focus on is how the Précis develops um, what ha had appeared in the guerre and analyze that as we go along and do it in a chronological way so that we see the different elements in this patchwork, that we see how they are uh, quite different and they are very different. When you look at uh, how the, the text, um, um, how the text develops. Um, just maybe to bring in, I mean, I, I, um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on how that um, happens here because uh, it, it is, it's, it's just so complex, the relationship between individual chapters and how they change over time, but it is at the same time a very interesting um, history of, uh, which shows you really how Voltaire thinks as a historian. That's what I think is great about these texts, that um, their difference, but yet their relatedness, reveals um, these aspects of Voltaire as a, as a, as an, as a, as a historian, uh, as somebody who writes history and how he operates. So this historical praxis is really uh, comes to the fore through seeing how um, when the purpose of a particular chapter or even a particular anecdote within a particular chapter changes from being this work written as a historiographer to one which actually uh, is a continuation of his broader uh, historiographical project, the Essay sur l'histoire générale or Essay sur les mœurs, how that uh, changes, what changes does he bring to that? And I think that's a fascinating part of, of what's on. And I, I suppose What's, what's great about the Précis is that in such, in, in a relatively short text, it is quite a short uh, text of his, uh, short historical text in any case, we manage to see all these different aspects and also see this evolution um, as we go through the text, moving from um, these accounts of uh, war, some of which are taken wholesale from the Histoire de la Guerre de 1741, to the much later editions, which are highly um, polemical and very political as well. So we see, as Colin was mentioning, this um, change almost in Voltaire's identity and all within one text. I think that's what makes it such a, a fascinating um, a text. But I, I just want to come to a couple of points that Shifra and, um, that Shifra and, and Colin have um, made. I, I'm interested um, 
by uh, Schieffer's comments about um, um, women. And it, what it brought to mind for me was one of the um, sort of richest sources of our understanding of how the guerre was actually seen at the time or understood by Voltaire's contemporaries. And even though uh, it, it, it wasn't fully published, only a, 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 you know, about well, a little more than half of it was published in this unauthorized edition, were the comments, the feedback that uh, was written by um, the um, Maréchal de Noailles, so uh, Maréchal de France, who had been sent this edition, this um, a, a sort of an early state of the text, and um, wrote a very detailed um, comments on it, page by page, um, pointing out factual errors, um, and then gave a general assessment at the end. I should po point out actually that it's thanks to um, Rogerio Scuto who uh, located this in the uh, Archive um, Diplomatique in Paris that we owe this, but uh, it's very interesting reflections. But one of the, it, then when he's finishing off, he he sets out these just these broad general comments on the text. He talks about um, how the text is not really a uh, military history because that seems to be what he was expecting, that it would be of no use to uh, military men, um, that it uh, contains too much information or um, uh, um, points of view that would seem to um, support the pretensions of France's enemies, which is to say that it is objective. Um, and that it is full of uh, reflections that he uh, describes in inverted commas as philosophique, and that there is nothing in it that would not be um, above um, a woman reader's uh, abilities. And in a way, it, it's, it's an interesting um, summary of, of his views on it, because what he intended as criticism is precisely, I would say, what Voltaire would have said, that's exactly what I want to write. That is exactly the kind of history that I want to write. I want to write history that is readable, that is um, understandable, that is uh, digestible, that is philosophical, and that is um, objective uh, at the same time. And um, I think it kind of, um, it, it, this uh, remark is also related to one of um, uh, Colin's uh, comments about you know, the other histories that uh, Voltaire was dealing with at the time um, or that, that he was maybe reacting against. And in a way, I suppose one of the features of these texts, both the Guerre and the Précis, is he's writing, um, you know, very contemporary uh, history. And what was fascinating, and again, what makes this text different from other um, historical text and what makes the annotation of it uh, a different kind of exercise to the annotation of other texts such as the essay um, is that the kind of sources that he used were uh, inevitably very different. He couldn't rely on um, a whole range of uh, histories as he would have done. I mean, he had a, 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 there was a set uh, selection of um, uh, texts that he, histories that he was able to rely on for writing the Siècle de uh, Louis XIV, for example. Here it was quite different. Um, and in a way, uh, what he's relying on there, or, or what's remarkable really, is that when you do read the histories of other contemporary historians, those who like him were writing at the same time, the, the difference is just uh, huge. Um, they write in, uh, you know, several volumes, what he writes in uh, one volume. Uh, they give blow by blow accounts of um, some, you know, details of the marche, contre marche, uh, whereas he um, can often dismiss uh, a whole war in a couple of lines. So there is a real uh, go, going back to what Schieffer says as well about um, the, the historiographical points, there's a real desire in his part to actually communicate with the reader. And of course, that's something that we always associate with um, Voltaire as well. Um, 
maybe I'll just respond to one final point um, that um, Colin uh, made, because I think it's a particularly relevant, relevant one here, uh, precisely because uh, this is a contemporary history. And that's this idea that Voltaire is not writing from a fixed uh, point. And that's something that's difficult to deal with. We, we do try and address that um, um, in the final uh, part four of, of the, the text, but it's, it's such a, it's kind of a slippery uh, notion to, to deal with. Um, and and it, I suppose it relates to this question of Voltaire's uh, sources, because obviously he relied on contemporary uh, sources and he had, a, he had access to, when, when he was Historia Kaff in particular, um, well, in particular in 1745 and uh, 46, he had access to uh, re battlefield reports, to the reports from uh, generals. He ha had access to uh, privileged um, um, uh, sources. Uh, but at the same time, for the most part throughout the text, he's, he, he still is, he, he's usually fairly distant, and what, what I mean fairly distant, maybe, you know, three to five years from what he's describing, which means that he does, he, he, he is generally able to bring a certain, I suppose, what you might call a historical perspective to these very recent events. I think the only time where you see that slip is really in the very final editions that he makes to the Précis, which he only writes in, let's say, the, you know, 1768 um, and includes in 1769. For example, his account of the, um, the expulsion of the Jesuits from various states in uh, Bourbon, uh, Europe. Um, there we see him actually on uh, three separate occasions uh, update the chapter. So he, it first appears in 1763, the sort of the start of this. Um, and then uh, we, we see him update the chapter as he goes through. And then as he goes back, uh, he also changes and tries to add in, you know, sentences that seem like more historical reflections. So there's this interesting process where he's trying to almost um, make his text more historical. Um, um, as he's as he's going through, and it's just an interesting um, phenomenon throughout this text because um, he's he's always writing at at, at, a, at a at a certain distance, relying on other um, histories, but the present is always there as well. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it there for the moment. I mean, there are lots of other things to say that um, both Schiffer and Colin uh, brought up, but maybe. There, there, there might be an opportunity to say that in the in the Q and A, and and other people might have questions as well. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, James. Again, that was a fantastic overview. You, you covered lots and lots of points there. Um, I don't know where to start, really. I mean, one of the things to start with is that both Colin and Schieffer referred to the just the sheer brilliance of the writing, really the vivaciousness of the writing, and you came back to that is talking about it as as readable history and Voltaire's desire to communicate. So I think that's a, one of the big takeaways from this, isn't it? That it's a very accessible work. Of course, you, and that was a wonderful passage you quoted where the person says this is sort of, could be read by women. So not a very PC thing to say on International Women's Day because this was clearly meant to be derogatory. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, actually it ties in with the criticisms that were made of Voltaire's historians say by the German historians in the late 18th century who, who condemned Voltaire for not having footnotes. Um, and one of the things that we discovered, for example, in the edition of this is sur les Meurs, is that Voltaire gives dates for the numbers of deaths in a battle or something. You sometimes think he's pulled this out of the air. And, and what we discovered is he never does. Everything he says, I think we, it was Diego Venturino came to the same conclusion in his edition of the Set Louis XIV. Um, Voltaire doesn't invent it. He's very, very scrupulous about using sources when he can find them. Of course, contemporary history is a bit different because perhaps there aren't the same number of sources. But he's actually, there is a seriousness of his, of, 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 of undertaking underlying the this, this sort of superficially brilliant style, isn't there? And I think that's true of this text as well as of the other histories. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned there, um, maybe for contemporary history, there not being the same number of sources. In a way, um, you could also you can also see the opposite phenomenon where he actually has a wealth of sources at his disposal in terms of a whole range of, um, you know, um, uh, 
gazettes that uh, he could rely on for an account of a particular um, battle for, you know, figures. I mean, um, we, we, we've discussed this before, um, Janet, how he is uh, certainly scrupulous, but he would have had a, a lot of conflicting information at his disposal at this time because he wouldn't have been relying on, um, you know, an established uh, kind of reference history of um, the, 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 the period. He would have instead maybe had to... Uh, make a decision um, or, or kind of do some rough calculations himself or sort of choose a, a figure that seemed reasonable among all the figures given. Janice, yeah, you were. Uh, I was just going to uh, add that uh, for the Gerd account here, uh, of course, to an extent Voltaire himself was uh, the source uh, for, uh, for later historians. Uh, and it was a bad war for France, and that indeed, and, and the Seven Years' War as well. And there weren't so very many French people, um, French historians, writing. Voltaire used uh, English historians, particularly a man called Richard Rolt. Um, and he, uh, he said that he, he thought that gazettes uh, were peddled, uh, peddled fake news. Uh, and so he really was rather reluctant to use uh, printed printed sources unless he ab absolutely had to. And then, as you say, he didn't say so. Uh, and he often uh, confused the two so that if he gives a source for the number of deaths or the number of people in a battalion, it might be that one of his sources said that the, the regiment had so many fewer battalions than somebody else's. And then that's Voltaire's figure for that regiment. So you just can't, it's really serendipity whether you can find some of the information or not. Thank you. I was very struck by Colin's uh, comment that, that Voltaire sees war in global terms. Uh, well, of course, of course he does. He talks about the war in Canada, that he talks about the war in India and so on. Um, and that is a very modern, and that, that is a, an insight you might expect of under a modern historian. S I just wondered, uh, this perhaps might be a question to Schieffer and Colin as well, but is there, are there things that you take away from this about Voltaire as, his, um, as, a, his, as a his, what insights as a historian does he have that are interesting? Uh, I mean, the, the, the perception of a global war does seem an interesting insight, actually. Maybe I could jump in there just to say, I'll let Colin answer the perception of the, of the global war discussion. But certainly, uh, as I perceive Voltaire, um, he writes these histories, and I'd love to know if James and Janet agree with me, but as a European, and I know we, we've talked a little bit about his maybe distance from the subject. And I wonder if, if that's really because, I mean, he's physically abroad or in exile, or it's, it's, he's not centered in Paris in these years. And I wonder, if, certainly for me, that influences how he writes and what he writes, and probably also influenced what he had access to. Hmm. Yes, if I come in on that, I think, well, obviously it, in a way it's very Eurocentric. It's not the sort of global history one wants to look at the both sides of the encounter in a sort of um, symmetrical way that one would do, would do now. But, but it is, he does try and globalise and he does try and see the importance of what happens over there uh, to here. On the other hand, you know, and it's obviously relevant in terms of the discussion that uh, Janet and James have led, Sources are so much different, you know, when you're at thousands of miles removed, that's one thing. When you're sort of, you know, from even from uh, where he is uh, on the border there up to Paris is nothing compared with the, out to Canada or whatever. But I thought it was really interesting because, you know, obviously the quote that everyone makes of, about Voltaire is, you know, the, you know, however many arpents of uh, snow in the north sort of thing is that that's Canada off, you know, with one little comment. I thought it was very interesting to see that. That was for me, it was uh, a more balanced view of Voltaire that I got out of it. Yes, it's impossible to uh, ever get... Can I also say the thing that which I didn't really enjoy? <laughs> I thought, well, you know, that's not uh, going to add much to the um, knowledge of, the, of nations, was uh, his, his, his religious stuff. I don't think it's very good, really, because he's so he's so involved in his own, uh, uh, you know, view of, view of the world and view of superstition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Funnily enough, you know, to bring up, you know, when I was writing the history of the, uh, the 18th century, I thought one thing I can do with this, I can try and understand what the heck Janssen and the 
Jansenism is and why it's so important. And I frankly wouldn't really get that out of Bergog there because, you know, it's basically these guys are not living in the 18th century, you know, get over it, you know, join the 18th century and then we can talk sensibly and rationally in some ways. So that's the sort of downside, if you like. I've got, I've got a question here from Greg Brown. Hi, Greg. Um, so I'm reading Greg's typed question. Thank you for these evocative comments and for this rigorous and fascinating edition. This is for any of the speakers. Um, so much of the scholarship of the later 19th, early 20th century debated Voltaire as a poet versus a philosopher, those words in quotes. Uh, for those scholars, the histories were problematic to interpret. So his question is really about how working on this text, either as an editor or as a commentator, um, how, does, how do you think about the nature of Voltaire as a writer? That's up for anyone here. We, we've partly touched on that already, talking about the, 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 the accessibility of the style, I suppose. Um, and Schiffer talked a bit about the context of putting this in the context of his histories and, uh, and other works. Yeah, I mean, I could maybe add to that while the others are thinking, just um, thanks, Greg, for that message. Um, I suppose one thing that strikes me is that Voltaire started writing history for many reasons, didn't he? And some of it was because he really, as you've already said here, he really disliked contemporary histories, the length of them, the details of them. And he particularly did it because Madame du Châtelet uh, herself abhorred history and he wanted to persuade her that it was worth reading. And so he wanted to he wanted to write history that was worth reading. And so he fashions his history in such a way that he has his reader in mind. But he also does it because he's fighting against Bossuet and the traditionalists and the histoire universelle. And that's also a way of getting away from a Judeo-Christian centered uh, piece of, of history. So Voltaire is trying to do something different. Um, as for the reception of Voltaire himself, well, uh, Greg, unfortunately, I don't know how many people are reading Voltaire's histories these days. I certainly hope with this edition, much more uh, readers out there will, will come and, and, and dip in because they are entertaining, no matter what we think. I mean, one can read them as a non-historian or as somebody perhaps who isn't particularly interested in history, but who wants to read a Voltairean text. They're, they're energetic texts. They're as James has said, they, you know, he polishes off battles in a few lines or in a few pages and, and there's a delight around them. And we also get a very Voltairean perspective on the world, which I think can be quite fun in itself. I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say now. Well, David Hume in, in, in his lifetime was a bestseller, wasn't he, as a historian of England? I mean, we, we, he wasn't just what I was a philosopher as we tend to think, he was a, he was a huge, um, hugely successful, materially successful author as, as, as a historian. So there wasn't, there must have been some appetite for, for history that was broadly readable and popular. I think, did I, I think Arvi has a question. Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for the presentations. And also uh, I would like to thank the editors, uh, not only for the really meticulously uh, edited and uh, presented uh, edition, but also for the fantastic introduction, 170 pages of an introduction uh, in volume 29A of the of Complet, um, which really kind of uh, um, makes some order for us as readers uh, in this sort of jumble of different texts that keep changing throughout the 18th century. So I, for one, found it extremely helpful and uh, I learned a lot. Um, my question, perhaps unsurprisingly, given my recent edition of Frederick the Great's uh, philosophical writings, uh, uh, concerned the relationship between uh, Frederick and Voltaire, and especially concerning history writing, because of course, Frederick is a writer of history as well, of course, of contemporary history. And in his prefaces, especially to Histoire de Montaigne, uh, he says, he, he really sort of uh, presents us with an apology for modern contemporary history, saying it is not for some Benedictine uh, antiquarian in the 29th century to write about us. It is for us to write about what happens in the 18th century. Uh, however, I think his perception of the audience and the purpose of this history is quite different because he keeps uh, basically saying it's posterity. I write only to posterity, I just don't care 
what my contemporaries think of these histories, how well they, they sell and uh, what level of curiosity there is um, uh, or, or of, uh, what, what kind of market there is for these histories. Uh, it seems from what you've been saying that Voltaire is much more um, sensitive, of course, to contemporary readers, to contemporary um, sales and so on. So did they discuss uh, their different perceptions of uh, the intended audiences of contemporary histories? Uh, Janet. Um, thank you, Arvi. Um, and just to pick up the point uh, you made about the Histoire de Montan uh, and the interesting preface that's translated in your own book that we were discussing uh, last time, I think that um, Frederick was sort of talking on two fronts there uh, and that he was partly um, trying to um, sort of excuse himself in a way and justify himself because he had been a very fair weather friend to France during that war, twice making peace by himself with Maria Theresa in 1742 and then in 1745, leaving France with half an army stranded in, in Germany. So he says, doesn't he, um, that it's one thing to make a promise between individuals, but when your country is at stake, it's something quite different. Well, that may sound profound, but in fact, there was a sort of reason, uh, a reason behind it. Uh, and he also says in that text in particular that he's writing for posterity um, because, in fact, I think he was writing possibly an Ed memoir for himself because that text is very frank and very personal, written uh, in the first person, very different from the text in the Oeuvre Posthume, which I think is 1775 or something. Uh, so he criticizes everybody very freely uh, and says that the Battle de Fontenoy was all very well, but it was as much use to him as a battle fought on the plains of China because he wasn't interested uh, uh, in that part of Germany. Um, and he also tried to get Voltaire to commit to not publishing his own text uh, until after he had died and for saying that that was, should be only for posterity. And Voltaire tries to agree, but when I was trying to uh, think of her, about Greg's question just now, I did wonder whether that was the case and whether Voltaire often, uh, in fact, suggests that his um, work should be left for posterity and whether he was really being very tongue in cheek uh, and expected to publish it, uh, intended to publish it uh, all the way along. Um, we worked together um, um, on the Yale notebooks in which uh, there are some long, quote, long um, excerpts from uh, the Histoire de Montan. There's no doubt that uh, Frederick and Voltaire compared the war in fairly great detail in 1752 while Voltaire was completing his manuscript and after Frederick had written his Histoire de Montan. Sorry if I've gone on for too long about that. Which is also, of course, the moment when he just only just published the Cite Louis XIV. So, I mean, yeah. this is extraordinary how Voltaire keeps all these yeah. different things going in parallel. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I've got another question, if I may, from JB Shank. So, greetings. Hello, JB. And uh, JB's uh, listening from Minnesota. Uh, he says, Thank you for organizing this wonderful series. I have a general question, uh, and I know that I hear Greg has already asked this in part, uh, that any one of the panelists might uh, like to answer. Colin mentioned the opacity of Voltaire's position as royal historiographer. Um, and there is also Voltaire's stated dream of being the modern Racine, i.e. a great playwright. To that, we can add his identity as a new kind of philosophe. So my question is what your panelists think the persona of Voltaire historian meant to him, or Voltaire historien, what did it mean to him? And in relation to the other persona, such as Voltaire philosophe, how do we understand those identities today as historians? That's a big question. I don't know who'd like to, uh, maybe Colin? <laughs> well, I come in, I went, in any, hello, JB, hi, hi Greg, uh, as well, but um, I won't in any way be able to answer those questions. But can I go with the flow of the sort of questioning that's already uh, been going on and just uh, make a number of observations? The first is that I think, as Nicholas, you were saying a couple of questions back, interesting that there's an audience for history. And I think that that is something that's important for, for works like this to come in much more into the uh, historical, uh, uh, historiographical main, mainstream really, to remind us that the Enlightenment isn't ahistorical or isn't all about the abstract values, but actually has a very strong historical uh, uh, sense. 
I mean, I think Voltaire, as a, as, a, as a historian, I mean, he's always suffered. It's anyone who writes history before the Rankian revolution of the 19th century. You know, he has, it's not just he doesn't have his footnotes. He doesn't, you know, he just doesn't have that sort of, uh, 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 sort of allegedly sort of professional sort of um, uh, status uh, for, for the historian, which, which was established in the, around the 19th century German seminar uh, uh, table. So he's always suffered in that respect. But on the other hand, I think a way in which uh, uh, history and history writing is looked at, you know, really the last 30, 40, 40 years, well, you could say, see uh, Hayden White as a sort of a, 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 a pivotal figure for a sort of change, where one thinks about even, you know, history, not in terms of scientific history or non-scientific, or whatever, but in terms of uh, uh, patterns and rhetorical uh, devices and rhetorical schemes and things uh, like that. And in terms of the identity and the persona, I mean, that's what I found really interesting, or one of the many things I found really interesting about considering uh, these texts is that, you know, you, it isn't a synthesis. You know, you've got the man, as I say, he's, he's moving about over 25 years in this uh, period. And in some ways, you, the, the, the text itself is a battlefield or, you know, put it more kindly, a workshop in which these different uh, positions and personas are sort of conflicting and sort of uh, opposing each other in different ways. And, you know, it's very difficult, therefore, to say this is his, his persona. So I'd see it as multiple and I'd see that that text itself as a particular exemplification of the internal as well as the external sort of audience driven uh, sort of uh, motivation that uh, that was behind the text. Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting comment, but an, an excellent question as well. Um, and just, I suppose, the way, the, the first thing I'd like to say in relation to the question is, um, I think, you know, I think Voltaire really wanted to be historiographe de France. And I insist on that title, historiographe de France, as opposed to uh, Du Roi, which is um, what he, he, he was actually named as, even though that, that title wasn't as common as historiographe uh, Du Roi. But it was something he, he, and you can see that in the correspondence that he, he you know, he, he's offered the um, uh, gentil homme ordinaire de la chambre du roi, and he says, okay, fine, yeah, but um, he, he clearly wants that. And I think, I mean, the way I uh, read that desire is that um, he actually wants to sort of buy being named historiographe, which didn't require one to uh, write histories even, but by doing so, and by actually being a historian as well, that he would actually elevate uh, history as a genre, and particularly his kind of uh, history. So that it was in a way, a, a first sign of some sort of official approval, you know, um, like a proper official approval um, for what he was and what he had already started to become because you know he had already um plans for the siècle de louis XIV. he had already plans for the uh essay um at this stage and it was a platform for him as well you know a, a personal platform for his um interest in in history and that sort of uh, dominates this period well not not dominates because he's obviously hugely productive in other areas as well but it's a, it's such an important part of his uh, output across um, uh, these years that, that, that we're talking about. But I think what's also interesting is that, you know, how does that persona relate to other ones? I think what you notice, particularly in the Précis, is that in the later uh, chapters, these later editions, particularly the late um, 1760s, the, it, where, where things become uh, much more polemical, and even if, if you compare the treatment, let's say, of the um, War of the Austrian Succession, taken mainly from um, the Guerre, and then the Seven Years' War, it's 25 chapters versus five. Mm -hmm. It's almost like he's lost interest in, you know, writing history for its own sake. And the history itself has started to become a vehicle for um, his sort of broader, um, you know, uh, philosophical desire to écraser la femme, you know? So there's, um, I think you can see that uh, phenomenon to a certain extent, even though in the way he writes those later um, chapters, they're, 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 they're quite different. They, they bring in a lot of polemical um, aspects. And what's interesting actually is that, you know, one of those chapters, he actually self-plagiarizes. It's one of those chapters that is actually three chapters from his um, um, commentary on Beccaria. 
you know, so three chapters just brought in wholesale, oh, that'll be my chapter now on, on, on justice. And it turns into this call for reform. Similarly, half of the chapter that discusses uh, Lali, whom uh, Shifra has uh, already uh, mentioned, it's almost like a judicial memoir on his behalf that, that stands up there with anything he wrote on uh, behalf of uh, Calas. So there's almost this sort of merging on the one hand of uh, the philosophical with the historical and the precis, but also at the same time, and interestingly, you know, several of these texts around the late 1760s, um, you know, from the Dictionnaire Philosophique um, onwards, second half of the 1760s, that bring in a huge amount of historical, um, a historical approach to his um, cause for uh, religious tolerance. So there's almost this kind of like this, this merging or this overlap of um, the historical and the philosophical in the in the late 1760s, I think. I don't know if anyone, any other, I mean, I'm just thinking of, of J.B. Schenck's question that um, in some ways it seems to me that his persona as a, as a philosopher come actually incorporates his persona as he is a historian. So at the minute, I'm, I'm at this minute thinking about how to introduce the lettre philosophique. So we normally think of that as a, we don't think of that as a historical text. We categorize that typically as something different. But actually, when you look carefully at the Let philosophy, he's okay. He's he has one parallel with the Précy, which of course he's writing about a contemporary culture. So um, Schiffer quoted that wonderful thing, set anecdote unique. I love that. I love that. Um, he does something pretty similar to Let philosophy. So when he tells you about Congreve, um, uh, he says actually, I went. To, it, it just drops in. Well, I went to see him. Well, when I met him, he was really quite old. Um, so he just tells you he met him. So you better believe what he says. So it's the same technique. But also, although he doesn't deliberately discuss English history, he knows that his readers of the philosophy, certainly the French readers, uh, are completely obsessed with Cromwell and the fact that the English were regicides. And he never addresses that directly, but on several occasions, Cromwell is dropped in always, and in more than one letter. And it's, um, it's always not quite a, exculpate him is always to put Cromwell in a slightly more flattering light to say that well he was a product of religious dissension and that actually not as many people died in the English civil wars as in many other civil wars and there's a slight attempt to sort of redress the balance or the way that the continental Europeans perhaps judge England because of Cromwell and that clearly is part of a way that he's now presenting modern England as being a commercial liberal tolerant society and so on so there is um I think there is a sort of a, a there is a historical or historian's thread running through the way he builds the Let Philosophique, for example. So it's there, uh, and it's in, I think it's right that it's in England that he first thinks about writing the Sept Louis XIV. Uh, and the, indeed, the phrase Sept Louis XIV first occurs as a phrase in the Let Philosophique. So there is a certain historical process of thinking <laughs> that comes out of being in England, um, which picks up a bit also something that um, Schufer said about how he thinks best when he's abroad sometimes. <laughs> I think it's a, very, it's a very telling comment, isn't it? There's just one um, uh, uh, one thing that you, your comment remi reminds me of, um, Nicholas, and uh, it's a question, I suppose, that I uh, would ask myself <laughs> about the 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 Précy and about just these uh, volumes, and I suppose I'd ask it because um, I don't have an answer, and um, it, it's something that I think. Um, I, I mean, we we sort of approach uh, addressing it, but I'm not sure that we actually can answer it because, you know, we don't have any uh, answer to it. But the question is really, you know, why he has a, a clear concept from an early stage, as you mentioned, of the siècle de Louis XIV. He understands it as a, as a siècle, now, not just a, you know, a, a century, but as a particular age with a particular mm -hmm. culture and uh, attached to it. And, you know, we, we talk about his then Précis du siècle de Licans, but that, that, that concept for him doesn't actually come about until such a late stage, 1768, before that concept even, before that concept comes to him, a siècle de Louis XV. Uh, uh, so, in fact, everything that he has written and that we see as being part of the Précis du siècle de Louis XV was actually written into uh, you know, updated editions of the Siècle de Louis XIV. Hmm. And, um, you know, in, in the preface to his, uh, I can't remember if it's the 17, if it's the first edition or if it's a, if it's a 56th edition of the, 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 the Siècle, he 
explains this as saying, well, you know, because um, all of these um, changes which have happened under Louis the Fifteenth, there were things that started under Louis the Fourteenth, and therefore it's sort of like the the, the culmination of that. But the, that 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 concept of the a siècle, a particular age with a particular um, culture, doesn't uh, come to him. And the question then, I suppose, is well, why does it come to him at the very end of the 1760s? You know, hmm. what, 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 is there actually for Voltaire a siècle de 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 Louis XV? Is there this um, discrete culture which has emerged um, under you know as part of this age? Um, and that distinguishes it from what has come before or um, not? Or is this simply, or is it the case that at this stage, um, these continuous uh, additions to the siècle de Louis XIV actually take away from the siècle de Louis XIV as a, mm. as a unit, as a, as a kind of a historical moment, mm. you know? So, you know, there are, um, th th that's, that's something I'm not... Um... Is, is a very hard question to answer because there is one big difference, which is that he's hugely, he, Voltaire, is hugely proud of how he says at one point in one of poem, I was born in the century of Louis XIV, uh, established his birthright. He never really likes Louis XV, does he? We can't go into this now, that was sadly there's not time, but I mean, there is a real problem that actually... Um, <laughs> He has a very tense relationship. He was wants to be loved by Louis Cairns, and he never is. So that's part of the problem. We actually must. JB Shanks got a last point before we stop. I like JB's point about Eastern de du Roi position as Voltaire entering officialdom. Google says appointments occurred in 45 after the Grand Jour de Fouché is now perpetual secretary of the Academy of Sciences, replacing Fontenelle. So, yes, it's a. Um, so it's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the key point about him being nominated Eastern de de France is that he actually, it's a position at court, isn't it? It gives him access, I think to be precise, it gives him access to papers that he didn't otherwise have. And it gives him access to people. I mean, he, he was physically present. You were meant, to, one of the things you, as, as, as historical is that you were physically present at the court and you could attend certain ceremonies with the king and so on. So it gave him the chance to talk to people, to even sort of quiz them. I, mean, yeah. I, I think we should... Come think, Sorry, come in that, uh, Nicholas, because after all, there is no archive national. You know, when we're writing history now, we pop along yeah. there and expect to find it all nice, nicely done. And obviously, it has been done since in the centuries, but at that time, there isn't the same sort of sense of a, a central depository or repository of state archives that could be just looked at by someone who's doing the history. So, in other words, personal contact and their archives, one assumes. Uh, it's actually uh, really, really important for historian work. And I think that in the French sort of establishment, where they want to position Voltaire very much on the left, I mean, I'm being a bit crude, but that, that is generally speaking true, um, it doesn't always go down well in France to say that Voltaire wanted to be a courtier. I mean, he was a courtier. Uh, he was a monarchist, and he was a courtier, and he, he was a courtier twice, because he had to resign his position as in order to be a courtier in Potsdam. So uh, he has two experiences of being, the second one ends badly, of course, but he has two experiences of being at court. It's a very particular angle for his story. Mm. I'm looking at my watch, and I'm really sorry to say that I think we probably ought to wrap up, but there, does anyone have any last, Janet, I didn't want to cut across you. Would you like to have the last word, please? Oh, goodness, I don't... <laughs> I <think I'd> <laughs> no about. pressure. Justice, well, thank you very much indeed once again, uh, Colin and Shifra, and uh, did you and Arvi for this discussion about the edition. You've made it sound almost more interesting than we realised. And it's true that we did uh, begin on our very first week almost by saying, what does this say about the siècle? And it was still the very last question we said <laughs> no at the end. I just want to say to finish with that the, all the editions we produce in the Voltaire Foundation, are, it's all the effort of, of huge teams and lots of help from lots of people. And before we close, I do want to say thank you, especially to Dr. Alison Oliver. She was the research editor on this edition and worked alongside James and Janet and had yeah. a huge hand in the, in the, the excellence of the final product. And I know Alison's listening. She she didn't want to join in with me as a question master, but thank you, Alison, because you played a big role. Yes, thank you, Alison. Thank you, Alison and James. Thank you very much, Colin, and thank you, Shifa, for all the time you put in in preparing this. It's, it's a mark of a good session. That I'm, there are questions just coming in, which I'm afraid I'm not allowed to pick up now. So um, it could have gone on much longer, and that's really a sign of, um, of uh, how much we've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, we'll continue.
in another term. Thank you. Good night.